Good afternoon. Uh, so I'm Eamon Duckworth. I'm a landscape architect and urban ecologist at Biohabitats. And Biohabitats, sorry, I'm just going to reset the clock here. Apologies. <clears throat> and now Biohabitats is a design and planning firm that focuses on conservation planning, ecological restoration, and regenerative design. Um, before I get started, I'd like to just take a minute and uh, you know, give thanks and an acknowledgement to the Serrano and Coahuila people, the original and continued caretakers of the Redlands area. Uh, I'd like to promote the idea that as we're planning and designing on the land that we take the time to acknowledge and honor its original inhabitants. Um, I'm here today to speak about geodesign for ecological planning, which is going to be rooted in the science of urban ecology, a uh, fairly uh, younger field in the ecological sciences. It was uh, about the late 90s that uh, two of the uh, urban long-term ecological research programs were established. And uh, you know, urban ecology has kind of evolved from uh, this idea of ecology in cities, so looking at remnant ecosystems within urban or urbanizing areas with less attention to the areas outside of those intact habitats. And more recently, it's been moving to this idea of the ecology of cities. So uh, looking at the city as an ecosystem unto itself, uh, and the idea that the social sciences, uh, governance, stewardship are important components of understanding the full urban ecology of the city. And then also to this idea of ecology for cities. So understanding how uh, ecological research can inform and help shape improved futures for our urban ecosystems. <clears throat> this also draws from the idea of ecosystem services. So what, what are the benefits that nature uh, provides us for free if we uh, take care of her properly? Um, also, uh, landscape ecology research that's now moving and drawing new insights um, from moving into urban areas and understanding how they behave. Also, social ecological systems, so uh, human social systems, natural biophysical systems, how they interact over time and at different scales. And by way of exploring some of these themes, I'm going to be presenting uh, the Atlanta Urban Ecology Framework, a project that we worked on with the Atlanta uh, Department of City Planning that looks at the ecological resources and open space resources of the city of Atlanta. Preceding our work, uh, the planning department undertook a, a, kind of a visioning of the identity of the city called Atlanta City Design that was rooted in uh, kind of the legacy and the uh, aspirations of the concept of the beloved community from uh, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. In this study, they recognized that as the region grows to 8 million people, we believe the city of Atlanta will nearly triple its current population, growing from 465,000 today to 1.2 million by 2040. So a significant change projected here um, for a U.S. city. <clears throat> uh, as part of city design, there was also a, a first pass at understanding where some of this density might occur, where growth should be concentrated, and in areas of the city that sh uh, less growth and less uh, density of that increased population should occur. They also set forth the concept that the city is going to design for people, for nature, and for people in nature. And you know, the concepts of urban ecology and some of these themes I was just discussing are a very strong marriage for understanding well, what should the framework of the urban ecological resources of the city be. So we start with the idea of the, a story of place, which can range from, uh, you know, on the left, how Atlanta interacts with continental scale bird migration patterns to on the right an understanding of what does it mean for Atlanta to be a city in the southern Piedmont ecoregion. And then down to the level of detail of understanding uh, citizens of the community and of the city. What are their stories? What is their understanding of what urban nature is? What are the, the types and specific places that are important to them? So there's this process of kind of co-discovering and co-creating an understanding of what is the story of Atlanta, the place, and what is the story of its urban ecology. We espouse the idea that to realize the full potential of our city, we must recognize that the plants, animals, soil, and waterways of Atlanta are a part of our beloved community. So with this common uh, shared understanding of the story of place, we moved on to a needs assessment with the four goals on the left of protection, equity, multifunctionality, and stewardship, we arranged an analysis in four categories to respond to those 
focuses uh, habitat and biodiversity, ecosystem services, parks and open space, and environmental and climate justice. Uh, sometimes uh, habitat and biodiversity is put under the umbrella of ecosystem services. Uh, here we specifically pulled it out, acknowledging uh, kind of the, the agency and the importance and value of habitat and biodiversity separate from the services that it provides to the city and its citizens. <clears throat> so beginning with habitat and biodiversity, Atlanta is often called the city in a forest. Uh, you can see on the top in comparison to uh, a number of other major U.S. cities, it has a very high tree canopy, somewhere around the, uh, 47%. Some of that is based on its growth patterns. It's a fairly sprawling city uh, that has a lot of remnant forest throughout. <clears throat> and while Atlanta and you know, several other cities are often focused, it's an important metric, you know, what is the total tree canopy? What we really want to introduce is, well, what is the next level of understanding of the true ecological function of this city? Uh, not just its total canopy, but not every tree is the same, not every forest patch or, or, or fragment of habitat is the same. So how can we understand those on a deeper level? We relied uh, significantly on a previous uh, study by Georgia Tech on the tree canopy of the city, which we then aug augmented with some additional land cover and tree canopy classification. Uh, we also relied on a, a significant uh, eye tree plot study by the U.S. Forest Service, numerous citizen science and Department of Natural Resources species observation of occurrences throughout the city and the surroundings. It began with the theme of uniqueness. So uh, in this map and for all that follow, the, the darker color is going to be the higher value. And here, the, the darker green, we're pointing out areas of, of highest uniqueness value for habitat and biodiversity. So that's looking at um, high conservation priority species territory, mature forest, interior forest. We were able to look at uh, historic aerials, do some textural classification to actually extract the historic canopy out of the black and white photos, comparison to uh, historic topo, some of the existing eye tree plots of the conditions of the trees today, to, um, to outline where some of the oldest forests of the city are uh, which will have some significant uh, history of creation of biodiversity structure. Also looking at aquatic and riparian resources, important ecotones and important for animal access to water. Soils, mature forest soils, uh, urban soils with uh, less disturbance that have more intact soil profiles. Forest patch size, you know, strong correlation between forest patch size and urban biodiversity and the urban ecology literature. And here we calibrated it by the specific species that are observed in the city. Vertical diversity, recognizing that uh, the mature forest structure and its multi-levels of vegetation provide significantly different habitat value than trees and lawn in many of the urban parks in this city. And we rolled those up into a summary of habitat and biodiversity. Then looked at well, what areas of these high habitat uh, value are currently protected, either in parks or in conservation easements. And you can see some important uh, you know, large patches in some sections, particularly in the southern part of the city, but comparison to unprotected areas, a significant amount of high biodiversity area outside of any direct protection. We also looked at uh, building permit densities and trends to understand what areas of this habitat and biodiversity are at, at greatest threat uh, for, for future development. This population increase that I mentioned earlier has is, is already been booming. <clears throat> and we also looked at here are areas of development cores and corridors that the city is planning to help accept some of the greater uh, volume of this current and future density that's going to occur. And then here, under this metric, we saw that they, they did a pretty good uh, job in, in identifying um, where some of these areas might be with less kind of ecological tension and, and conflict. I also looked at streams. Most of the streams uh, in the city originate in the, in the center and radiate outward. So they're originating in the downtown core. So even streams at the periphery of the city are, are picking up a significant amount of impact from that, the dense impervious development of the downtown. So we looked at stream buffers, uh, you know, the, the level of imperviousness contributing to different streams, uh, field data that had been collected by the Department of Watershed Management to, to understand well, where are the healthiest habitats of streams and where are our restoration needs and priorities. We also looked at habitat connectivity. So in this uh, habitat and biodiversity assessment, we discovered uh, a significant amount of mature interior forest and larger forest patches that weren't really on the mental map uh, of many of the residents or even the Department of City Planning, unless you happen to be directly familiar with that particular landscape in the city. 
uh, landscapes that are Im important for preservation of species that, uh, and here's several birds that are you know, common in, in past decades but are now in steep decline, such as the wood thrush, brown creeper. Then we also looked at regional connectivity, so understanding how the city engages with regional connectivity patterns. Uh, relying here on the Esri Green infrastructure mapping that's shown, but also a number of other studies um, done both academically and in the, the nonprofit world um, to, to start to understand how this engages uh, regionally. <clears throat> then, under, once we understood, well, where are the points of engagement between our city scale connectivity analysis and the, the existing regional studies, we then use those, the larger interior forest patches throughout the city. Uh, and did some interior forest habitat connectivity modeling uh, using circuitscape, least cost path approach, doing some barrier mapping to quantify what areas, if they were reforested, could provide the greatest connectivity enhancement. Here, the, that, the flow uh, from that model is summarized at the watershed level, so you can see this arc of green um, in, the, in the lower section of the city that was uh, you know, kind of a new revelation for the understanding of importance. And it is here with this study that we started to see some tensions between these proposed development corridors and where, uh, you know, while those corridors were avoiding the large forest habitats, the connectivity between them was important and need, would need to be addressed. <clears throat> this was done at a pretty high resolution so that you can start to zoom in and see uh, neighborhood patterns, uh, patterns of flow, and so we and the, the planning department and citizens can start to understand, you know, they look up their neighborhood how it interacts with this model to some of the larger patches that might be in other parts of the city that aren't necessarily in their, uh, their mental understanding of the, the city's urban ecology. We also looked at ecosystem services. So carbon storage in trees and in soil, where are the, the, the greatest provision of that service? Areas that are providing the greatest value for flood mitigation, for water purification. <clears throat> Here looking at the urban heat island signature for this city. In red, the downtown core and some of its um, radiant development corridors, and then looking at the areas of the highest heat island hazard and then and intersecting them with areas and neighborhoods of low tree canopy to understand what areas might have the greatest need for urban greening and enhancement of the tree canopy to provide uh, a benefit for this service. Air quality needs, so looking at measured and then modeled particulate air pollution in the city, again, uh, radiating from the, the downtown and, uh, and these development corridors. And then again, looking at areas of higher particulate pollution that also have areas of low tree canopy that could benefit from additional tree canopy and surface to help uh, trap and then distill some of that uh, particulate irritants. <clears throat> also parks and open space access. So here we're looking at a, a 10 minute walk network analysis, the park deserts in red uh, for the existing park network of this city. Then we also looked at uh, uh, deserts related to high biodiversity parks. So maybe you have access to what is technically a park in the city, but not necessarily achieving or having access to that higher uh, value and the greater experience to wild or urban nature. Also recognizing that uh, a nature center is different from a rec center, which is different from a playground. So this looks at diversity of park access. So here in the, the darker purples are areas that have a walk shed to um, a greater variety of parks. Within these park deserts, uh, we looked at high biodiversity areas as a first pass to understand where new parks might be that could, also, that could preserve existing resources but also provide additional access to, to nature. <clears throat> Our other analysis was environmental and climate justice. So one of the metrics that we used uh, we utilized the CDC Social Vulnerability Index we saw within the, the metrics that are incorporated in that a, a pretty good synergy in the literature with um, you know, actual factors that provide barriers to access to recreation, uh, that in, um, enhance the, the harm that are done from heat ion effects, particulate air pollution. Here looking at park deserts, the, the dark red is areas of high social vulnerability. So within that park deserts, we can then start to prioritize park desert needs. Um, people who might have less opportunity and access to, to hop across town and experience some of the other urban nature in those areas. We also looked at uh, population density. So where can we target the greatest amount of people with limited resources uh, and the, you know, the greatest vulnerability of people that may have those needs. Uh, here, low tree canopy neighborhoods and social vulnerability, heat island and social vulnerability, 
air pollution and social vulnerability. So you can start to see some distinct hot spots that are emerging when you start to layer uh, these various themes together. And for environmental and climate justice, the concept of ecological democracy is very important. The, the process of engaged citizens helping craft the future of their city under this framework. Through uh, numerous public workshops, here are some summary maps uh, that were identified uh, of opportunities in the city, risks throughout the city, uh, a first pass at a draft community vision for what this new green network might look like, also, the analysis that we, that we did was presented in web maps so people could look up their, their neighborhood, their home, and understand uh, how they fit into the analysis that we were doing. And so how do we take this analysis and you know, engage it into action or, or plant the seeds for, for future change? Here, a network of, uh, a protection network of high priority throughout the city. Oh, and then a restoration network that would expand and augment that protection network. Uh, a review and a re refinement of some of the areas for planned future density to understand well, what might need to happen at those intersections that are important for habitat connectivity. Looking at opportunities for additional tree canopy, so potential planted area, you know, screening out things like utility easements, uh, ball fields, cemeteries, areas that aren't you know, necessarily ideal for a significant urban tree canopy. Um, but then also showing here in red where they overlap with our restoration network, which might be the highest priority. Looking at neighborhoods and street tree right of way. So here in the, in the red, the orange, and then the yellow, areas that would have both the greatest opportunity and the greatest need uh, for additional street tree planting to in increase some of these ecosystem services that we've been talking about. And looking at that, past canopy changes, um, and then also development trends, we set looking at different land uses of the city's uh, future goals uh, for maintaining and then enhancing and expanding the additional tree canopy of the city. Uh, two large uh, generational scale major parks to help uh, uh, protect the resources and provide access to wild urban nature. Retreat and adventure, so an expanded trail network, increased trail and bike lane access to the existing and proposed parks. Uh, a network of uh, new parks, again prioritizing park deserts, vulnerable communities, high population density. Eco clusters, Three growth areas that would be outside of the urban core but connected to public transportation that could be models uh, for sustainable and regenerative development. Uh, we drafted a list of principles for how these might be moved forward and then did some illustrations of using our protection and restoration network and the other analysis from our data, how that could start to shape uh, as an example of what uh, that, that eco cluster might be. And so these, these recommendations and a number of other details make up the physical uh, framework of the urban ecology framework. We also had a number of uh, policy change recommendations using some of the data. Uh, here we're, we're currently working with the city on a rewrite of their tree protection ordinance. So this is taking the, the city scale framework. It was also done at a, a high resolution, so there, there's value when you zoom in, but zooming in and understanding at the parcel level and at the scale of the tree protection ordinance, um, you know, how that takes shape. We also developed a model tree population. So using the iTree data, the various analysis from our, the framework that we did uh, to develop a model tree population so you can test metrics and thresholds in those metrics for the ordinance and understand if the ordinance included a certain category of metrics, how that might affect the tree population now and in the future. Uh, also, uh, additional recommendations for metrics to measure progress in achieving the plan. The city is gonna be undertaking a zoning rewrite to implement some of these uh, features. Uh, we're working with the city in a funding and incentive strategy, synergies with transportation planning, strategies for how this greening can occur without gentrification and displacement of communities, engagement, education, and outreach programs, and cross-departmental coordination, understanding that the, the city operationally is, is gonna have to coordinate a little differently to achieve this more holistic vision. And so we can uh, continue to regenerate the social and ecological systems of our cities. And here, showing one example of a, a process and a project outcome of how the science of urban ecology and geodesign are married to help shape the future of the city in a, a forest, uh, to make a future that is both more vibrant and verdant for its citizens. Thanks very much. <laughs>